if we can bring down the nitrogen surplus, especially the bought in nitrogen, uh, because we're using our slurry better or we're getting more efficiency of the, the nitrogen that we're coming that's coming in from from having improved soil fertility, that's a key measure for the carbon piece or from reducing greenhouse gases in its own right. Hello, I'm James Dunn, and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights, and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. There's always been challenges and opportunities within the dairy sector. One of these challenges is for farmers to continue to improve their environmental credentials. I'm delighted to be joined today by Chagas researcher, Dr. David Wall, to discuss where some of these opportunities are for farmers to improve in this context. So thanks for joining us, David. Well, James, yeah, no, it's good to be on. It's good to be on here um, discussing these topical issues. When we talk about this space, what, what exactly are we talking about when we're um, asking a farmer to improve the environmental footprint of their farm? Look, at the, the environmental footprint um, can dovetail very much with, with, with standard farming. You know, it's about improving the water quality in, in the area or maintaining the water quality in the area if it's, if it's already good. And sure, every farmer uh, certainly wants that because they're using the water and, and the animals are drinking the, the, the local water. The next area would be carbon and, and greenhouse gases. So reducing the carbon footprint, that means either sequestering some carbon, we can talk about that, or reducing the emissions coming from uh, the, the standard practices on the farm that would be all tied up there in carbon footprint. And the third area might be enhancing uh, what you have in terms of biodiversity or adding to that in terms of, you know, more habitats if, if there was an opportunity to put in a hedge or leave a corner or whatever else. But those three areas are, are probably key areas there in terms of enhancing or improving the environmental sustainability. And I suppose it's fair to say, David, when we discuss, and we've heard a lot more about, about these issues um, over the last number of years, but farmers probably feel somewhat aggrieved listening to farmers in terms of a lot of farmers are have maybe implemented these practices already and within the media, maybe they don't get um, fair play at times. Is that fair to say? Yeah, probably. Uh, we're probably not good at, at saying what we are doing uh, as, a, as a sector. And believe me, there's a lot going on on farms. There always has been a lot going on on, on farms like we're, we're a grass based system. So in terms of uh, relative to other parts of the country or other parts of the world, should I say, or even Europe or whatever, we naturally have a lot going on there in terms of a permanent soil cover, a permanent crop. Uh, in our, our grassland, we have loads of, of hedgerows, etc. We're not, um, in terms of our system, you know, we, 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 I suppose, recycle the manure, which cuts down on fertilizer and pesticide input. So relatively, we have a lot going on naturally. And then in the last probably 10 years, maybe even 15 years, farmers have adopted Huge practice, huge. There's huge number of practices there. Technologies on farms, like a lot of of our, our dairy farms, are certainly at the top of their game in terms of taking on new measures. The likes of your protected urea, your low emission slurry spreading, um, managing hedgerows better. You know, fencing off water courses. There's a hell of a lot of practices, and we probably need to be shouting that a little bit more. Um, representing ourselves a little bit better in terms of those national debates there over who's the, the, the root cause of all the issues and uh, more so who's doing something about it. And certainly agriculture and farmers are putting their shoulder to the wheel, in my opinion. Well, maybe to come to that water quality piece that you um, that you mentioned there, obviously it is, is, is it's obvious significance given its role in, in securing future nitrous irrigations for the country. Um, I see, I see Chagas have launched a new water quality campaign titled Better Farming from Water. As you say, it, it, it's, it's, eight key practices identified and they fall under really three categories um david you might maybe just run through and how does that fit or how does how, how do those practices look at commercial farm level yeah look at um this is a really important point and and uh, any any dairy farmer with their finger on the pulse will know the enormity of getting water quality right um immediately almost you know and 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 that derogation being so important for our grass-based system. 
Um, in terms of the, the the practices, I suppose the three main areas, and these, you know, every farmer is considering these main areas in, in terms of daily daily management, um, nutrient management being the first area, you know, getting your 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 soil testing done, your nutrient management plan done, and then ultimately reducing the surplus of nutrients going into the farm. So that's the 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 surplus, the additional nutrients over what you're actually using and taking off of the farm. And we want to keep that surplus low because, you know, any 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 large surplus that's left over has a potential to be lost. It's not it's not um, a given that it's going to be lost, but it has a higher potential. And the other thing about it is we don't want to be losing nutrients because they're a loss on investment. You know, you're not getting the return on those investment. Yeah. Um, that David is that's the uh, and and lots of farmers are going to have seen that and and hearing that in terms of this kind of nitrogen surplus measure and um it's one of these measures that maybe has come come to the fore um recently Ex- what exactly does that mean and where should a farmer be targeting yeah look at this is the key measure you know it's the key measure on the nitrogen side so what we're talking about here is the areas of the farm that are more freely drained, that the nitri- nitrogen will move with the with the percolating water through the soil and leach out of the, the root zone. You know, so that's that's kind of the, the situation we're talking about. On the phosphorus side, you're talking about heavier soils where the water will move over, it'll saturate and move over land over the top of the soil and carry phosphorus with it. But back to that nitrogen piece, the surplus, if we think about the surplus, we all take in various sources of nitrogen onto the farm. So uh, it could be fertilizer. It could be in the concentrate feed that we're bringing in across the farm gate. Obviously, the protein has a nitrogen uh, content in, in it. And then if we were importing uh, slurry, that would also be another source of nitrogen. So they would be the main ones coming in across the farm gate. And if we think about our exports out of the farm uh, that have nitrogen in them, there's protein in the milk. So the milk uh, lorry is coming in and out of the farm and carrying with it the milk, but also carrying with it some nitrogen there. That's an offtake from the farm in the final product. If we we're selling calves or selling uh, cull cows or, or animals in, in general off the farm, they'll have some nitrogen in them. Those would be the two main uh, sources of in uh, coming off in product. And then if you were exporting slurry, um to stay within in nitrates limits or etc there's nitrogen going off the farm in that so if we think about the inputs versus the outputs typically the the inputs are higher than the outputs in that situation and in that situation then we end up with a slight surplus now it's understandable in a grass-based system or in any production system that you will have a little bit more in terms of an input than you're taking off obviously there's the efficiency in that but once th- that input becomes very, very large relative to the off, off, off uh, output or, or offtake, in terms of nitrogen, we end up with a large nitrogen surplus rather than a balance. A balance is where one would equal the other. In that situation, on the freely drained soils, typically towards the end of the year or you know, in, in the back end in the close period when there's a lot of rainfall and there's a lot of leaching going on, if that surplus is there in the soil, in the root zone, I, I kind of say in the sump, it's waiting to be lost potentially uh, if those conditions and wet conditions uh, come forward. So basically what we want to do is we want to feed the, the the grass. We want to produce, we'll say if it was a cropping situation, the very same. But we want to feed the grass, we want to feed the silage through the year. Typically, there's very little leaching at this time of the year. We're in the height of the summer. Um uh, although it, it'll rain, the grass will utilize that 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 uh, that rainfall um, for for growth. But it's the back end of the year there. If there's nitrogen there and the water starts to move, um, then there's more potential for loss. And if we can bring down that surplus um, on the farm, it's better for your bottom bottom line. Obviously, you're not losing as many nutrients. Um, that will be one of the key measures there in improving water quality in our rivers. Mm. When we are on the topic of nitrogen, um, what role has soil for soil fertility to play in nitrogen use efficiency? We're in a space where we're we're being tasked with using less chemical nitrogen. Um, so it's important, David, that 
you know, in terms of productivity and grassland productivity, um, is consistent or even improved on some farms. So, um, what role is soil fertility to use in, or soil fertility to play in that, making sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck as such? Look at um, soil fertility has been around for an age, and and when we talk about soil fertility, we typically call, talk about your your pH or your lime, your P and your K, and in none of those words, lime, P or K, phosphorus or potassium, do we think about nitrogen straight up? And and look at that's understandable. However, if we, if I was to use the analogy, you know, of you're putting fuel into your system, so the fuel is in the nitrogen, so you have a, a a big machine, it's mowing grass there and it's using loads of fuel, loads of nitrogen to, to keep the system going. However, if you didn't put in your engine oil, you know, into that system, you can put in as much fuel as you like, but eventually the system is going to seize and that fuel is not going to be used very efficiently. You know, you'll have the <laughs> you'll have the black smoke and then you'll have the blue smoke, you know, coming out of the engine. So in that situation there. That lime, the pH is probably number one. The P, uh, phosphorus and potassium then, phosphorus in the spring in particular, early growth and that growth there for, for silage first cut. And then potash kind of mid-season into the back end is really critical in terms of keeping that nitrogen uh, being utilised more efficiently. When we boil all that down, um, we did a, a study looking across 25 dairy farms um, right across the country. And what we found was where the pH, so the, the 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 lime wasn't being used, P and K in the fields on those farms where, where they were on the floor, you know, index one and two uh, or pH uh, less than six, 5.5, a lot of those fields, et cetera. Um, we were getting 35% nitrogen use efficiency. So from every 100 kilos of nitrogen that was going out, there was only 35 kilos being utilized. Now, you know, in any any return on investment, et cetera, you wouldn't be happy with those kind of uh, returns. Now, when we move that forward and we looked at the fields that were optimized, so the pH uh, at least 6.3 uh, or above, the P and K index 3 uh, at, at least, we were moving that dial without telling those farmers to change one practice to reduce nitrogen and uh, we didn't do one 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 change on those farms. We nearly got 70, 69 to be percent uh, to be precise, percent nitrogen use efficiency in those fields. Uh, so you know you were doubling the nitrogen use efficiency effectively just by getting the pH and P and K right. So uh, it, it's not to be underestimated. It's it's really critical. The other opportunities within that um, water quality piece or practice piece, like what. What are the other big ones for you, David? Yeah, look, at uh, if we think about the farmyard as the next kind of pillar area. So we went, you know, the, the nutrient management is one area and that's the the, the plans and the surplus. Um, the farmyard is, is the next key area. And some of this is housekeeping around the farmyard, you know, making sure that there's not runoff from dirty areas, separating water, et cetera. So we're not filling up tanks with with water that, that doesn't need to be going in there and, and taking capacity. But probably the big one is slurry storage. Because once we have the slurry storage, obviously it's easier on demand uh, and the management in the winter when you're busy doing other jobs, be it you know feeding stock, getting stock ready, calving cows, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to be rushing out in the field. But that's also key there in terms of having those nutrients stored um, not being lost and not being forced to go out, I would say, in times when uh, you didn't want to go out. And, and this year being a case in point, like uh, obviously I'm in the in, down in the sunny, sunny southeast is where I'm based and I'm farming myself. Um, we usually have a, a shorter winter relative to other areas up the country. And, you know, there's no doubt about that. But this year we didn't get it that way. And anybody that was close to the limits there or, or, or didn't have enough slurry storage was really cut short this year and forced to, to go when, when soils weren't in good condition, when there was no growth because there was, you know, things were too wet. And that's a, a, a bit of a disaster, I suppose, for, for, for a water quality uh, perspective, but also in terms of your nutrient management and getting the value out of that slurry when, you know, your fertilizer limits are being cut. 
that probably is a key area. I realise it's expensive. I was going to go the, the, the next bit, James. I realise yeah. it's expensive, but it'll pay dividends in the long run. The last kind of um, of those three pillars within that campaign is is that land management piece. So maybe just comment on that. Yeah, look, at in terms of the, the, the land management, um, what we're talking about here is those riparian zones, I suppose, along by rivers and streams um, being, being one area, you know, areas that maybe were, were, were wetter and, and have been drained or, 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 or cleaned up somewhat. Those were doing the job in the landscape. Um, they were buffering um, uh, areas above them that were maybe farmed more intensively and doing a, doing a good job uh, on, on the farm. So, you know, getting the fencing right, uh, bringing the, the fencing back from the banks uh, that little bit. The, the whole area, uh, the, the, the technical term is hydromorphology of the stream um, means that, you know, naturally a stream will meander and, and move through the landscape. And with that meandering or whatever, it's it's taken out sediment and, and um, uh, creating a habitat for the flora and the fauna that, that are in the, in the water, especially the, 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 the micro macro invertebrates there in the water. And once we go in and, and try to straighten those streams or whatever, it, it, it really destroys that habitat somewhat and, and causes the stream to, to, I suppose, to deposit more um, sediment and things in gravels there that fish need to spawn. So we should stay away and stay out of those streams uh, on, on the farms observe the setback distances because those areas, uh, those riparian areas or, or wet areas down along the bottom um, close to the stream are doing a job. And look, at if we look after those, that's that's uh, really important. The other thing there is breaking the pathway. If, if you're on heavier soils and there is overland flow, those hedges in the landscape that are going across the hill uh, or, or, or little mounds and buns uh, across the hill are really, really important there. On, on both tillage farms, but also on grassland farms. And, you know, most farmers will know their farms fairly well. They know where the water goes and where the water flows over the head of the ground on, on wet soils. And those areas then need to be looked after and, and, and stay out of them. Coming on to the, the to the carbon piece, you mentioned a couple of them already. What should farmers be looking at? A lot of farmers obviously using the protected urea already, using the less. There are a couple of key ones that, that are there already. Is there is there anything else that they should be looking at in the immediate? Yeah, look at um much of what we talked about is actually going to pay dividends for, for, for carbon as well. So if we can bring down the nitrogen surplus, especially the bought in nitrogen, uh, because we're using our slurry better, or we're getting more efficiency of the the nitrogen that we're coming that's coming in from from having improved soil fertility. Uh, that's a key measure for the carbon piece, or from reducing greenhouse gases in its own right. Lime being another key area. Um, I mentioned protected urea, so if we can change from the the can piece, or even the straight urea piece from an uh, an ammonia emissions or, or another emission source and move into protected urea, there's credit straight away on that. The minute you pick it up, it goes on your 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 chemical fertilizer register. You have credits there and then uh, before you even spread it. Um, on that, the, David, just because yeah. it, it does, it, it crops up now and again in terms of um, the protected urea versus the can and does it work as well and so on and so forth. Can you maybe just comment on that um, because it still pops up now and again? Yeah, no, and then look at, this is a confidence thing. Uh, I, I can understand farmers using can-based products there have good results for the last 20, 30, 40 years maybe. And this is a big change. You know, it's a change to to to, to a different product. Um People didn't like urea in the past, especially when they got out beyond April, and for good reason, uh, because we were losing some of the nitrogen in that, and and they didn't get the same bang for their buck by spreading urea in certain weather conditions or, or whatever. And, and, you know, that's tried and tested there. However, with the protected urea, we have uh, almost 11 years' work done on protected urea. We're using it on all the Chagas Research Farms for at least the last six years, um, consistently in all weather conditions, etc. And if I go back to the research, the early research, we tried 
um, at three sites. So one uh, up, up in Hillsborough, Moore Park and Johnstown Castle. So three different soil types, a heavy soil, uh, an, an intermediate soil in Johnstown Castle and a very light soil in, in Moore Park. And over those three years of work, uh, putting it out at different times of the year, different rates from 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 uh, 100 kilos uh, total nitrogen per per hectare per year, right up to 500 kilos, so a very high rate of nitrogen per year. Protected uh, urea consistently yielded as much as can in those short terms, so three years work. We got higher nitrogen recovery with the protected urea compared with the can. And when we look at the long-term work, so we have a long-term trial that will be showing the results of uh, in Johnstown Castle at the open day. And um, in that long-term uh, work where it's now going on uh, all a, a full 11 years, we're into the 12th year this season, we're actually seeing a yield increase of somewhere between 7 and 10% as nitrogen, more nitrogen remains in the soil and is there. So look at uh, what I would say to farmers is, Try get it, get it, get a pallet, you know. Try uh, a little bit of it. There's efficiency there in terms of spreading. Obviously, you have a a product there that's either 38 or 46 percent if it's the straight uh, end product, uh, compared with a a, a can product at 27 percent in, and that product will go further. So you'll spread more. There's more uh, acres to be covered in terms of efficiency of spreading. Um. Putting it out in 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 sim similar levels, similar splits over the year, there'll always be nitrogen there for grass to grow in that situation, as well as nitrogen being returned in urine patches, etc. And what we've seen is uh, good results, consistent results in hot weather, in dry weather, in wet weather, etc. So I'd be very very confident in the protected urea, you know, the NVPT type products or two uh, MPT products. Uh, they're all there. Just ask your merchant and uh, see how you get on. Very, very good. Uh, you mentioned the less, you mentioned the protected urea. Anything else that's a quick Probably look at farmers? Some of the big ones there, I suppose, in terms of getting that, that body nitrogen down your clover, getting the clover into the sward um, is going to be critical going forward. We can see what's happening there under nitrates that, you know, the, the, the headline rates of nitrogen and these affect dairy farmers probably more so than 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 maybe some some other farmer cohorts. They're being trimmed all the time, and the likelihood, the signal at the moment is there. There's a, a another um, another five percent cut coming um, uh, in the mix, and and I think most advisors have planned for that in terms of nutrient management plans, and and farmers are are, are looking at that in terms of this year. Um, and who knows where that's going to go going forward. So like getting the, the clover into the swards, learning how to manage and adapt to clover, you know, that's not going to happen overnight. And getting it established is probably not going to happen overnight as well. So, you know, as fields come up for reseeding, et cetera, that would be a strategy uh, for the future, getting your farm set up uh, early so that you're 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 ready to go when and if those those um those further trimmings of, of nitrogen come uh, in in the farm that's a key one there in terms of of re reducing your your nitrogen footprint we've spoken about what's there and farmers need to adopt the technologies and practices that's there um is there anything within the research that you could say you think isn't far away david that's going to have a positive impact or um yeah. Is there things yeah. that you think maybe is further away, but that will come? Where, where's that space at? Yeah, look, at there's a lot of... The, uh, we didn't talk too much about the animal side. Um, it, it's more the other technologies, we'll say, in terms of the fertilizer technologies or the slurry technologies um, that are there. Uh, obviously, carbon itself, in terms of carbon sequestration, is there, deep rooting species, etc. cetera, um, getting that carbon... Uh, deeper into the soil where it can be stored and, and that can offset, I suppose, some of our emissions. But back to the animal side, I suppose there's a couple of key technologies um, currently under under research focus at the, at the moment. Uh, on the breeding side, uh, breeding animals with, with, with lower biogenic methane emissions. And I suppose 
that's going to take some time, I suppose, to to identify those traits, etc. But getting uh, an animal with a higher EBI and f- for all the various uh, sub sub indices there, looking at animals that are going to 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 stay on longer uh, in your herd, uh, reducing replacement rates, etc. That's going to be a key one because there's going to be less animals on the farm that are not milking or not producing. Uh, in terms of, of of dairy replacements, and ultimately then less biogenic methane or greenhouse gas emissions coming from those additional animals. So that's one key area. I suppose the other key area there that there's a a, a big research effort going on in Chagas and in our, our our partner institutes right across Europe and the world uh, is the whole area of feed additives. And you know while while. Those feed additives have been proven to work uh, in on Chagas farms and Chagas research stations um, in uh, TMR type systems. So, you know, winter milk systems, it's going on in Johnstown Castle, it's going on in, in Grange and the, on, on the beef animals as well, and in Moorpark. The big key for us is uh, to, to hold on to our grass based system. And then, how do we deploy that feed additive? Um, uh, to bring down the the, the methane that's produced uh, in the rumen, but keep that additive in the diet there while an animal is out grazing. And I suppose that's the the area there that that's under um, uh, much research focus in terms of can we have some slow release? Can we uh, you know deploy that in the parlor twice a day uh, and and come up with. Uh, uh, some mechanism, I suppose, to have that in the diet there for longer uh, between those two feed uh, opportunities. Um, the other area is even looking towards vaccines uh, in some areas. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of work going on in that space. And that would be a game changer. You mentioned you have an open day coming up. We've only, I would say, <laughs> we've only... Uh hit the tip of the iceberg as such in terms of having a, a conversation around some of the some of the front and centre practices, a lot of that research that you're talking about there obviously will be on display. But maybe when is that um, Chagas Johnstown Castle open day and what would farmers uh, get to see if they do attend? Yeah, look at all farmers, uh, very welcome. If, if you want to find out, I suppose, um, uh, all uh, about all these challenges, you know, I think the first thing is 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 having the, the literacy and the understanding of what the challenges are and, and trying to break those down into practical and simple terms. So, yeah, Farming for a Better Future 2024, that's the the the, the, the open day line um, at Johnstown Castle in County Wexford. It's Tuesday, the 16th of July, so roughly three weeks time. Um, everybody's welcome to the sunny southeast. Um what we'll we'll talk about is much of what we're talking about here today, uh, James. To be honest, we want to demonstrate, I suppose, technologies and practices for efficient, profitable, and environmentally sustainable farms, and building in that resilience piece. You talked about, you know, you mentioned a couple of times there in our conversation. What should farmers be thinking about for the future? That to me is resilience. If we put in the the, the grass clover, or if we adapt the system a little bit change our, our practices, uh, just tweak them, we can be resilient and ready for the future there. And, and I suppose some of the main things that we want to talk about are those animal technologies there uh, in terms of, you know, the breeding, the sex semen part of it and, and the results to date with that, the biogenic methane in terms of dairy cow nutrition and, and bringing down that biogenic methane. We'll also have the dairy beef systems on show um, um, which you know is the other add-on to that that dairy side, and, and very important, I would say, the multi-species sward for those on, on the on the spring calving herds. Um, how we're getting on five years in in terms of that multi-species sward, uh, Aidan and Bridget, we talking bringing through the results and the performance on that, and the huge opportunity there to wean ourselves off chemical nitrogen, and and you know it's it's startling. How, how low they've gone in, in terms of the nitrogen there with uh, great success, I would say, overall. More so on the other side of the house then in terms of the water quality campaign, those actions, those eight actions will be front and centre. And I challenge farmers to come down 
have a browse through and go home and uh, implement one or two of those actions on their farm in addition to what they're already doing. The latest on the greenhouse gas technologies there and carbon sequestration, that whole piece is, is kind of confusing to farmers uh, at the moment. Um, and I would say that that what we try to do is demonstrate those practices so they become, I, I suppose, understandable and see what you can do. See also what many farmers are already doing on their farm and that. The other big area, I suppose, soil health. Uh, it's new. It's coming. How do we get a better uh, soil health? There's a lot of compaction, as we all know, this year because of the wet weather. How do we what do we do about that? And how do we get especially those silage fields back? into to good work and order and not to forget our advisory colleagues there there'll be a massive area at the open day in Johnstown Castle in terms of the knowledge transfer advisory and education and what I would say there is understand the actions to maintain a, a, and enhance farm income you know there's many supports there and if farmers were aware of them they could tap into them through the advisory service and we want to break those down and, and make those I, I suppose, clear to farmers. So look at everybody's welcome. Tuesday, the, 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 the 16th of July. Um, book your holidays in Wexford and, 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 and come along on that day. As always, David, it's, um, it's a good day out. And as David says, we would encourage people to, um, to get down to Johnstown Castle. So look at David, I appreciate your time. It sounds like um, I'm sure everything's under control, but there's a bit of work to be done in the next well, look at, look uh, two to full, three weeks. Full well, steam ahead. Full steam ahead, James. <laughs> so that's it, folks, for, for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. My thanks to David Wall for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm James Dunn, and join us next time for your Dairy Edge.